Well, I have a very serious question to pose to you tonight, my dear friends. It has been said that no two countries that both had McDonald's have ever fought a war against each other since they got their McDonald's. Can this possibly be true? If you can disprove it, please let me know. If it's true, also, please let me know. Can that be the solution to all our problems? Well, that might not help the protagonist in tonight's story, but it's a very intriguing question indeed. So my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favourite drink. And listen. I live in the Jordanian refugee camp Zatari, where I teach a few children English for a pittance. Life's difficult here, for all of us, and it isn't getting any better. And because of my actions, I fear things are about to get a lot worse. Much worse for all of us. Even you. This is my warning, but it's also an apology. I didn't mean for any of this to happen, and I'm truly sorry. Let me give you some background so that you can at least understand my predicament. Zatari opened when the Syrian civil war began, and as more and more refugees entered the camp, it grew into a permanent settlement that today hosts almost a 100,000 people. I'm not exaggerating when I'm saying it has turned into a small city, with market stores, small shops, street food and other businesses. A small city in the middle of the desert. Hundreds upon hundreds of UNHCR tents stretch out all the way to the horizon. The camp is surrounded by a high wire fence for security, although to a lot of us it feels more like they're trying to keep us from escaping. For someone on the outside it might not look that bad, not with all the ordinary life activities happening everywhere, such as people washing their clothes or playing soccer, but it's not a particularly nice place. There's never enough food, water or medicine, and we only get between 12 and 14 hours of electricity each day from the solar power plant. Around 1,500 people arrive every day, making the camp more and more cramped and more and more dangerous. Before the Civil War began, my life was okay. The environment wasn't good. The drought made agriculture difficult and killed our country's livestock herds, but compared to how it is now... We did okay back then. I lived with my parents and siblings in Aleppo. We were Christians, but we mostly kept our religion to ourselves and tried to respect other faiths in the hopes they would respect ours. After the war broke out, chaos ensued. We had to fear almost everyone. There were so many different factions fighting for their own agenda. Worst of all was the Islamic State, which threatened pretty much anyone who didn't conform to their specific belief. We hoped for a miracle, but in the Battle of Aleppo, my entire family was killed when a missile struck our home. I survived because my parents had sent me to one of their friends in a nearby town in an attempt to put me somewhere safer. And they'd stayed with my brother, who was sick at the time and couldn't be transferred out of the city. In the end, my parents' friend drove me to the refugee camp where I now reside, when he couldn't assure my safety any more. The events I want to tell you about occurred last summer. I'd just been to one of the local shops. It was a hot day, just like every other day, and I was sweating profusely as I walked toward my tent. The sky was clear. I heard the sound of a helicopter in the distance, then came the thunder from two fighter jets. Even though I knew they weren't going to bomb this region, they still aroused a fear deep inside of me. It sounded as if they ripped the sky in two, like it was nothing more than a piece of paper. Further down the street, my fear was replaced by another kind of fear that I didn't quite expect. It was the kind of fear you get when something is about to happen, rather than when something has happened. Everything became quiet. The silence didn't feel natural, not in this place. A cool, almost chilly breeze followed, equally out of place. I stood in my tracks. Dust travelled with the wind, like a dancing mist right above the ground, and with that wind a small envelope reached me. 
As soon as I picked it up, everything returned to normal. The unbearable heat came back, and the cacophony of the camp came back too. I turned the envelope over. To my surprise, I saw that it had my name on it. Mariam Haddad. I couldn't wrap my head around it. Where did it come from? Slowly, I opened it. Inside, there was a small letter, more like a note, actually, and a rusty key that looked to be hundreds of years old. The letter was written in English. Dear Mariam, here is the key to your new home. Kind regards, leave. I didn't know what to make of it. I put everything back in the envelope, placed it in my pocket, and continued on my way back to my tent, trying to figure out who Leaf could be and what he'd meant. The letter didn't actually say anything about which door the key belonged to. My new home. I thought about my old home about my parents and brother who'd been killed, and about my friends who had either been captured or fled somewhere else. Was this some kind of cruel joke? I had lost everyone I loved. How could there ever be a new home for me, without the things that make a home a home? In either case, given the circumstances, the thought of finding a better place to live was laughable. I thought the letter and the key must have been a cruel joke, because what else than cruel would it be to try and give me false hope? The women near my tent were washing clothes when I came back. I was expected to help them out, but because of what had happened, I excused myself and said I didn't feel well today. While lying on the bed inside of the tent, a tent that I shared with three other women, I pulled out the key and looked at it. I couldn't make sense of it. I hadn't met anyone named Leaf at the camp, or anywhere else for that matter. My only logical explanation was still that it was some kind of sick joke, but something made me feel as if there was something far more strange than that going on. I put the key back again. I decided not to tell anyone. I didn't want to give whoever had given me the envelope the satisfaction of seeing me confused about it. As time passed by, I thought less and less of the key. I kept it in my pocket for a long time, but, but after a while, I placed it inside a small box under my bed. It wasn't until about six months later that I noticed something strange yet again. I'd begun working for another family, teaching English to their teenage daughter. And on the way to their home, I always passed by a small junk shop that never seemed to be open. It didn't look like a shop in an actual city, of course. It was more similar to a large shed or a garage. That was normal here, but at the time there was something off about it. I just couldn't put my finger on it. One day my curiosity got the best of me, and I decided to take some time to look inside the storefront. It didn't have a window, just a metal jalousie with some gaps. The shop was filled with old stuff. Everything from furniture to clothes to knickknacks. There was an old photo album open for display close to the storefront. I leaned in to get a better look at the pictures. And that's when I saw it. On one of the black and white pictures, there was a man wearing sunglasses. Next to it, I could read the following. Leif Anderson, 1909. Leaf. I stood there for a few minutes without moving, looking at the picture, perplexed. It almost made me late to work. On my way home, I tried to enter the store to get a closer look at the album, but, as expected, the door was locked. The door was locked. The key entered my mind, but I didn't dare to think about what I'd already subconsciously considered. Instead, I went back to my tent. I couldn't sleep the following night. Usually, it was difficult to sleep because of all the noises around me, but this night I was lying awake because of my own thoughts. What were the chances that the name Leaf would reappear like that in this place? There must be a connection between the key and the store. If nothing else, I thought, the store owner must be the one who gave me the envelope. 
On my way home from work the next day, I had the key with me. I stopped in front of the store. It was closed, as always. I looked around. The people around me didn't seem to pay any attention to me. Carefully, I put the key into the lock and turned it. It worked. I'd been right. I hesitated before I opened the door. I thought about how dangerous this was. After all, this wasn't a very safe place. It was better than the war zone I came from, but this was far from good in any sense of the word. The police kept some order, but there were plenty of crimes going on nonetheless. Theft, robbery, assault, rape, trafficking, even murder. What if this whole thing was a trap? I hope I won't regret this. I took a deep breath and opened the door. As soon as I stepped inside, everything went silent, just as it had when I found the envelope. The room seemed bigger on the inside than what it had looked like from the outside. It smelled somewhat musty, almost like my grandmother's old attic back home. Uh, hello? I said. No reply. There was no one here. I looked outside, standing in the doorframe. Everyone passed by without looking at me. Still, it felt like someone would see the open door sooner or later, so I closed it behind me. Was this supposed to be my new home? I thought I could sleep here, finally getting some peace and quiet. It wouldn't be like my childhood home, of course, but it would still be a miracle. A miracle? I thought God had abandoned me, or maybe never existed in the first place, but maybe this was a sign. If this was as good as it seemed, did it mean that Leaf was an angel watching over me? I had no answers, and after all my hardships I remained sceptical, but I had already begun to feel some semblance of hope. I looked around. The store was filled with what looked like vintage things from every era in history. Given how long this store had been closed, standing untouched in the middle of the camp, it was unbelievable that no one had broken in yet to steal something. A thick layer of dust covered most of the things. I saw everything from gowns, bodices and petticoats that looked to be several hundred years old to a calculator from the 1970s. In one of the corners, surrounded by bookshelves, there was a large globe. It looked old, but not ancient. I walked over to it and spun it around. The dust came flying off it and made me sneeze. After I'd wiped my nose, I noticed something odd. I didn't recognize some of the countries on the globe. At first, I thought it was because it displayed old nations, such as the Soviet Union. But when I looked closer... I realized that there was something else going on. A large text was printed over Europe. The Socialist Union of Europe. Well, my knowledge of history wasn't great, but I knew that no such union had ever existed. Maybe it was some old movie prop, I thought, and slowly walked further into the room. I went to the storefront and picked up the album. Aside from the old picture of Leaf, didn't contain anything strange, as far as I could see. There weren't any pictures of him other than the one I'd already seen. The rest were nothing more than vintage photographs from the beginning of the 20th century. A woman, wearing an evening gown that seemed typical for the time period, posed in a lot of the pictures. Wilhelmine Lindenlaub, 1912. Who was she? A bit disappointed that the album hadn't revealed anything that could help me explain all this, I turned around and looked at the room. I don't know why I didn't see it until now, but in the center of the room, there was a door frame standing by itself. It wasn't connected to any wall, but aside from that, it looked ordinary. I walked over to it to see if there was anything special about it. It felt as if my heart was about to stop when I looked at the door in the frame. My own name was written on the letterbox. Was this my new home? 
My hand trembled as I reached for the handle. I was about to open a door that couldn't lead anywhere, and yet I expected it to. I know it wasn't logical, but well, it was fate. The door was locked. I couldn't help but smile to myself. I picked up the key and stared at it for a couple of seconds. I told myself a silent prayer, and I unlocked the door. Before I dared to open it, I leaned forward and pressed my ear against it. I thought I could hear something, a faint bird song and some soft winds against the other side of the door. It made me cry of a happiness I couldn't explain. A warm breeze reached me after I opened the door. It smelled like flowers during a spring day. A beam of sunlight shone down on me, and I truly felt touched by God. It is a miracle. It is a miracle. It is a miracle. I hadn't really known what to expect, but what I saw on the other side of the door far exceeded whatever expectations I had had. In front of me there was a large garden, and in the middle of it there was a huge house that looked just like an ancient villa, with two large wings supported by white columns. A rectangular pond, filled with sapphire blue water, lay in the middle of the wings. All of this was located at the bottom of a valley that was surrounded by large green hills with mist-covered tops. The faint sound of a waterfall came from one of the hills fell down on my knees, engulfed by the light, and clasped my hands in prayer. Tears of joy ran down my cheeks. Was this heaven? After I got up, I turned and looked back into the store. I could see the shadows of the refugees through the gaps in the jalousy, walking back and forth, doing whatever they could to survive in the camp. And here I stood, so close and yet so far away from them. I closed the door behind me. In an instant, the crowds, the noises, the filth, the sand and all of my tribulations belonged to a world far, far away. And I was home. Just a few seconds after I closed the door, an envelope fell through the letterbox. Quickly, I opened the door, but there was no one there. I slowly closed it again and opened the letter. Dear Mariam, I'm happy you've moved into your new home. Please consider the following three rules, decided on by the Housing Society. Don't damage the property. Don't harm the animals. Don't let anyone inside. Regards, leave. Well, I didn't mind these rules. Given the circumstances, they seemed fairly reasonable. Although I still couldn't grasp what had happened, I felt deep gratitude toward Leaf. I still felt somewhat worried, but it was a worry that was mixed with a kind of childish excitement that arose from the possibilities this place offered me. The garden buzzed with life, and the colourful flowers smelled heavenly, like a happy memory that I'd lost somewhere on my way to Zatari. As I walked beside the pond, watching the koi solemnly swimming around in it, I stretched out my hand and touched the soft roses next to me. Is there anybody here? I yelled after I'd entered the villa. No one answered. A fresh cross breeze passed through the rooms. I took off my shoes in the hallway and walked into the living room. A golden chandelier hung over the large dinner table in the middle of the room. The kitchen which lay next to the living room, was equipped with everything one would need. The refrigerator and the pantry were filled with enough food to last for months. I didn't recognize any of the brands of the groceries, but I could still tell what they were. The rest of the villa was equally impressive. In the center of it, there was a small yard filled with exotic plants and Renaissance garden furniture. On the other end of the yard, there was a library with ebony bookshelves stretching all the way to the ceiling. The shelves were empty, as if waiting to be filled by me. The golden frames on the walls were empty as well, probably for the same reason. This was supposed to be my home, and I'd been given the chance to give it a personal touch. 
What stood out the most on the second floor was a study room with a nice view toward the garden, and what looked like an old-fashioned game room with a bar, but instead of a pool table, as would have been expected. The centerpiece was a board game I'd never seen before. Aside from these rooms, there were also several bathrooms and bedrooms, all equally luxurious. I could have stayed here for months without going back to my own worlds, and a big part of me considered it. But I still had responsibilities, and I still needed money for when the food would run out. In the end, I decided to sneak into this place whenever I could, and to spend as much time as possible here without drawing attention to myself. I had to be extremely careful, since I didn't want anyone to discover my secrets. I thought about that last rule. Don't let anyone inside. The first night, I stepped outside after sunset. In the distance, somewhere up in the hills, there was a faint howling. I turned my gaze up at the sky. I didn't recognize the stars, and the moon wasn't the same either. It was purple, or perhaps magenta, and thin white clouds could be seen wandering over its surface. The silhouette of a swarm of what looked like dragonflies passed in front of the moon. Given how far away they were, they must have been enormous. It scared me, but at the same time I couldn't imagine this peaceful place being dangerous. Still, those creatures made me think. Although this place was paradisiac, it wasn't how I imagined paradise. Before I saw those strange insects in the sky, I'd had some hope that I'd meet my lost family here as a kind of final touch to the miracle. Now I began to doubt that would happen. I went inside, still thinking about this. It was still a miracle, of that I felt sure. But it wasn't heaven. God truly works in mysterious ways, I thought, as I went to bed. I cried with happiness once again when I felt the soft sheets against my body. It had been such a long time ago that I'd felt the embrace of clean bedclothes. It reminded me of my childhood back when I had a bed and when my mother was still alive to prepare it for me. With that thought, my tears of joy turned into tears of sorrow. It was a sorrow I hadn't allowed myself to feel yet. It was liberating to finally cry, and although my sadness was profound, I also felt immense gratitude toward the angel who'd brought me to this place. I wrote down what had happened to me in my diary and concluded the entry with one of my happiest childhood memories. It was from when my parents had taken me and my brother to Palmyra. It had been such a lovely, peaceful day. My mother had held my hand, afraid to lose me in the crowd of tourists. In the end, I wrote as I sobbed, she did lose me in the crowd. I went to work as usual the next day, filled with energy after my first large breakfast in years, and pretended that I'd switched to another tent when the people who knew me asked where I'd spent the night. It started a few rumours, but I didn't care. It was better that they believed I'd found a boyfriend or become a prostitute than that they knew the truth. I lived like this, like a queen over a secret world of abundance, for a long time, and I was happy. The only problem was, the happier I felt... The more content I felt about my own life, the easier it was for me to see all the suffering around me in the camp. First, I tried to do whatever I could by bringing some of my food to the people who needed it the most, but in the end, it didn't resolve the conflict within myself. Why did I deserve this gift, and nobody else? I spent months struggling with these thoughts. How could I justify having an entire world to myself, when everyone in Zatari was hurting. As the civil war progressed, and more and more refugees arrived, the situation inside of the camp got worse. Protests erupted in the streets because of the shortages of food and water. Stones were thrown at the Jordanian police on a daily basis, and the police sometimes responded with even more violence. I spent more and more time at my new home, Partly because I wanted to avoid the chaos in the camp, but also because I needed to think. I prayed and prayed for a sign. The rule said not to let anyone inside. But did it still apply when people's lives were at stake? 
I wanted to get in touch with Leif so I could ask, but I didn't know how to do that. In the end, when my conscience got the best of me, I decided to interpret the rule as being weaker than the law of God. If the rule stood in the way of helping people in need, I had to ignore the rule and do the latter. Terrified of betraying my guardian angel, if that was what he truly was, I ventured out into the camp and searched for the poorest families I could find. I didn't care if they were Christians, Muslims or non-believers. Everyone deserved the gift of a decent life. I wasn't going to let them stay in my home forever, but at least until the situation in the camp got better. Surely, I thought, God would have wanted me to do this. I hadn't paid much attention to how the people I was about to save would react to the door in the shop and the magic surrounding it. The first family, a Shia Muslim family with four children, thought of it as equally miraculous as I did. But they also thought that I was a miracle. They cried tears of joy, not just because their troubles were over, but because their faith had finally been confirmed. The second family, a Kurdish family with two children, reacted in the same way, and so did the third family, which was Yazidi. The fourth family I brought into my home was Christian, just like me, but unlike the other families, they reacted with more caution. Everyone chose to stay, though, and they all thanked their own gods for the miracle that I had given them access to. And, to my express reluctance, they thought of me as a saint, and kept smuggling people inside of my new home over the course of a few months. Since I hadn't got any more letters in the mail, I thought my decision had been approved. I didn't just bring families into my home, although I did prioritise children and their parents, but also individuals that had ended up on the bottom for whatever reason. They were disabled, mentally ill, drug addicts or prostitutes. I didn't really care. They needed my help just the same. In the end, over the span of maybe five months, I had gathered 200 people, including children, in my home. They all lived inside or close to the villa. I'd been very clear about the rules and Everyone seemed to follow them. A couple of families began to sow the earth so that they wouldn't need to go outside to get food. Since they didn't have a key, they feared they wouldn't be able to come back in if they left. It was all going well, and everyone was getting along without any major incidents. Until one day. I was outside, trying to find a few more people to help, when the strange, eerie silence I'd experienced before fell over me once again. This time, it was late at night, and, given what I'd done, fear grew stronger and stronger inside of me. A new envelope, equally small as the first one, appeared in front of me. I swallowed loudly, preparing myself to be scolded, maybe even banished from my new home because of what I'd done. Instead, the letter merely made me confused. Dear Mariam, there's going to be an asteroid impact, and I'll have to connect the door to another point in time. You won't be able to go home for about two hours. I'm sorry for the inconvenience. Regards, Leaf. I didn't think. I just ran to the shop. People turned their heads as I ran past them, wondering what had gotten into me. Inside the shop, the door was nowhere to be seen. Didn't he know? I had no idea what to do. What had he meant? It wasn't until now, although frantic, that I began to think about it. An asteroid impact. Well, I had to search in my memory to recall what I'd been taught about those in school. Couldn't he prevent it? Wasn't he an angel? Maybe I'd gotten everything wrong in some horrific way. Hundreds of questions bounced around in my head. He didn't seem to know about the refugees. Why? Hadn't he been watching me from above? Wasn't that how he knew where I was all the time? I didn't have any answers to my questions. I simply repeated them to myself over and over again. 
I'll have to connect the door to another point in time. What did that mean? I sat down next to the old globe and stared at the empty space where the door had stood. If something bad were to happen to all those people, it would have been my fault. The rule had been clear, after all, and there weren't any exceptions to it. I simply wasn't supposed to let anyone inside, for their own safety, if nothing else. Why hadn't that crossed my mind before? That there might have been a larger picture to consider. I dwelled upon this for a long time, and then, literally in the blink of an eye, the door was back. Two hours had passed. I didn't dare to breathe as I pressed my ear to the door. Nothing. My eyes filled with tears. I feared what I would find on the other side. Another point in time. Slowly, I opened the door. I almost didn't recognize the place. Heavy, dark clouds covered the entire sky. The garden was gone, so was the villa. It had all been replaced by grey ash. The hills, once filled with life, were bare, and one of them had disappeared. I walked over the ash. Hello? I yelled. My voice echoed between the dark cliffs of the hills. Everything, and everyone, was gone. All dead from that impact, I thought with a heavy heart. I walked toward the opening left by the hill that had disappeared, and as I did so I left black footprints in the ash behind me. Cool winds came down from the hills that were still standing. The air smelt like burnt rubber. This place was even more dead than the desert I'd come from. The fossilized remains of one of the giant dragonflies, partly covered by the ash, lay in front of me. Must have been there for a long time, maybe more than a thousand years. When I came to the opening in the hills, I saw something else. A few miles to the west, there were enormous structures sticking up from the grey desert. They were taller than any skyscrapers I'd ever heard about, but they, oh, they just looked just as old and just as dead as the dragonfly. I decided to go to them to figure out what had happened. When I arrived, I saw that it was the remains of a large city. The streets were covered with ash. On a few structures, I could read some signs. The language was different from what I was used to, but I could still understand it. The signs appeared to have belonged to different stores, restaurants and hotels. I began to suspect who had built all of this, but I couldn't really believe it. Another point in time. I whispered to myself. I came to a large square. In the middle of it, there was a huge statue of a woman dressed in loose-fitting cotton clothing. When I got closer, I read its inscription. Our Saviour, Mariam. It didn't look like me, but it was meant to be me. Somehow a thousand years or more had passed in this world, and only two hours had gone by for me. Further down the street, I found a library. The shelves were filled with thousands of books. Most of them fell apart by the touch, but some of them could still be opened. My hope was to find some information about what had happened to this place, but most of the books seemed to be fiction and unrelated to what I wanted to know. One book caught my attention, though, since it had been placed on a pedestal. I was able to loosely translate its title to The Mariam Scripture. What I saw inside shocked me. It was my diary. I'd left it inside the villa before I'd gone out. I sat down in an old chair and began reading to the best of my ability. I recognized my entries, but they weren't written exactly as I'd written them. Things had been removed. Not just embarrassing stuff like when I complained about my period pains, but certain political opinions as well. And other things... A lot of things had been added. This infuriated me even more. According to this version of my diary, I would performed a plethora of miracles and other acts that I'd never done in reality. And the worst part was that a lot of the things I'd written 
had been altered. My opinions about the Islamic State, for example, was now about a group I'd never heard of, a group called the Yaz. Perhaps, I thought, they were the descendants of the Yazidi, but I couldn't be sure. This, I thought, was the only book, as far as I knew, that had been inside of my new home before I left. It was, I had to assume, the only written document of earth that they had been left with. To some extent, they had built their entire civilization based on it, on my diary. And, over time, power-hungry people must have shaped it to fit their own agenda. But what happened to them? I looked through more books in search of answers. One was titled, The Beginning and the End of the Fourth Great War. I leaped through it. At some point, I wasn't sure how long ago, there had been a war between four groups that might have been nations, kingdoms, or empires. To my great peril, it seemed to have been a religious war. One of the groups was called the Mar, and they seemed to have believed in the Mariam scripture. The Yaz, on the other hand, believed that Mariam, me, or at least a twisted version of me, was pure evil and had trapped them in a hostile world. The conflict between these groups had this difference in belief at its core, and they seem to have been fighting since forever. The war didn't explain what had happened to this world, though. It ended without any clear winner, and everything seemed to have gone back to whatever had been normal in this world. It wasn't until I went down one floor and found an archive with old newspapers that I finally found some answers. The most recent newspaper explained what had happened, raised even more questions. Antimatter obliteration after the glittering armada left the system. The glittering armada? And what did the system refer to? There was a damaged picture of a large group of objects floating in the air. I looked through earlier newspapers to see how this antimatter war had begun, but nothing made much sense to me, except that the glittering armada seemed to have been helmed by the Yaz. A newspaper from a few years earlier finally revealed the shocking truth. No. No, I thought, as I read the headline. Radio telescopes around the world confirms. Earth has been found. I knew what it meant, although I didn't understand how it was possible. Their telescopes had picked up radio waves emitted from Earth, confirming their mythology about their origin once and for all. Those objects hadn't been floating in the air, I realise now, but in space. As I understood it, the Mar had tried to stop the Yaz from leaving the solar system, but had been bombed from orbit as a result. And now, the Yaz were coming to reclaim their lost land. I returned to Zartari, without finding any more information than this. It was still night time. I looked up at the stars with tears in my eyes. The glittering armada was approaching, and I had no idea how long it would take for it to arrive. When I looked down again, another envelope had appeared in front of me. Dear Mariam, it has come to my attention that you have violated the rules of the Housing Society. There will be no penalty except for your immediate eviction from your new home. And the natural consequences of your actions. Regards, Lee. I cried. All of this was my own fault. All those people that I tried to help. All the things I put in motion and that eventually led to an antimatter holocaust. But Leaf was no angel. I knew that now. Perhaps he was a devil or something entirely different. God wouldn't have let any of this happen. Not the God that I believed in. I went back to my tent, filled with shame, anger, and fear, and opened my Bible in the hopes of finding some comfort. But all I could think about as I read my favorite passages was the twisted version of my diary.
could Mickey D's possibly be the solution to their problems? Please, please tell me it isn't. Oh my god, what kind of world would we be living in if it was? <laughs> well, Sunday treat for you there. Hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, as soon as I saw that one on No Sleep, I thought, well, I just have to read it to all of you, because I know you're going to love it. Um, well, as you might have seen recently, I've been trying to balance out between doing things from Dr. Creepman's Vault, the subreddit I set up, and stuff from No Sleep. Um, seems to be working quite well. So, um, if there's any story you've seen recently you'd love me to read, please let me know, and I'll uh, try and get in touch with the author and see what happens. Well, it's Sunday. You know what that means. I'm going to be back again tomorrow. Tomorrow night, yes I know. So, until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>